Okay, so for our last week woo and our last topic, we're going to switch and do IRT. So IRT is a latent variable model, but it is very different from what we've been doing, and we're actually going to use different packages for this. So we're going to use the LTM package for latent trait models and MERT, which is such a great package. It's also fun to say, MERT. So let's jump into item response theory. Okay. So basically we've spent all semester dealing with analyses that have mostly continuous data. Okay, the assumption is that the latent variable is a continuous variable. That's still true here. But what do I do if most of my data is actually categorical or ordered in some format? And IRT is specifically focused on generally what's called test theory, but well, you can use categorical variables in most latent models. So we use them for our multi-group models, but as a kind of a splitter for our pancakes, right? Um, and we can use binary variables as predictors, and we can use uh, ordered variables as predictors. You just have to set them up a little bit differently in Levon. And so once you get the basic idea of Levon's coding, you can look up, like, how do I do weighted least squares for ordered predictors, that kind of thing. But, you know, what do I do uh, if I want my um, variables to all be categorical? And you might be interested in IRT. So most people agree, though, if we back up for a step, that at least four response options can be treated as continuous without too much loss in interpretation. So if you have one of those Likert scales, one to five or whatever, generally we can assume some level of continuity. Now I want to talk about IRT specifically because let's say you do decide to use your scales as ordered, you're going to get output that looks a lot like IRT because it's going to be the same kind of basic thought process. So if you understand this stuff, you will understand the output you get from Levon. Okay. Also, IRT is really fun. So, um, you could treat them as categorical or we can treat them as continuous, but in this case, let's go with categorical. Now we do still have to assume that the underlying latent variable is continuous. Okay. We, we um, have not really covered anything where you assume that the latent variable is is yes or no, like in a log regression or something. In all of our cases, we're measuring some underlying con continuous uh, trait or ability, and maybe it's represented categorically or maybe it's represented continuously. Now, there are two approaches to, well, there's more than two, but there are two big approaches to thinking about categorical predictors we could do what's called an item factor analysis. And this is one thing the, the Levon book covers and shows you how to do. I think this is actually uh, more common in like traditional EFA, where it's an exploratory factor analysis on the um, polychoric or tetrachoric correlation table for categorical predictors, generally in binary format. Um, and most, some people might call that an item factor analysis. Instead, we could think about um, IRT. So an item factor analysis is a more traditional factor analysis approach, like we did at the very beginning of the semester, we've come back to it, where you're trying to eliminate bad items, you're trying to make sure that each item is related to its latent variable, and do they load appropriately, simple solutions, that kind of stuff. And it just treats the the categorical predictor as ordered or binary. And so we can think about loading, taking out bad questions, etc. In the Levon framework, you basically update the CFA argument and just say that which variables are ordered. Bam, it does it. And the output you'll see will look a lot like what we're going to talk about in the second IRT section on thresholds. And so you'll see instead of one loading, you'll get these thresholds. So how do I interpret those? And we'll cover that today. Okay. And the other thing we can try is IRT. IRT has a lot of uses, but generally is considered um, under the umbrella of test theory. 
So classical test theory. So when are people using this? It, let's say you decide you want to go work for ETS. This is a big testing company that runs um, nearly all of the like standardized <laughs> testing. Right, Pearson does some too, and they might be together now. I don't really remember. Um, but like the SAT and the MCAT and the GRE and the one you take, the GMAT, right, for business school. They're really interested in test theory because test theory tells you whether or not the item is a good item for the test. And so test theory does not have to be um, correct, incorrect answers. Right, so EFA is sometimes considered in the sort of in the middle between classic and new test theory. Um, but classical test theory is sometimes called true score theory. It's this idea that um, the test represents a person's true score and maybe plus some error. And any differences that you see in people's responses of like getting question one right or wrong are differences in the test takers underlying ability. So if we have a particularly difficult question on our GRE, uh, the differences where some people get right and some people get it wrong is because some people are just better at inability okay, than others. All right. <clears throat> There's like a moth buzzing around. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, Classical test theory focuses on reliability. So we actually calculated the uh, Chromebox alphas at the beginning of the semester. And it also focuses on item correlations, right? And so this is like test retest, Chromebox alpha. And the focus is more on the like kind of overall score. Anything you do by item, maybe is present the means and, and correlations. And the problem with classic, classic test theory is you cannot separate the differences in the issues with the test and the differences with the person. Okay. So the reason that we get different scores on our tests are because they're different people and they have different underlying traits. Okay. That doesn't tell me actually anything useful about the items on the test because sometimes you get differences on the items because the items are different. Okay. And so IRT allows us to to focus on the items themselves while also estimating the, the latent trait, their true score. And so this is sometimes called modern test theory, focusing on the latent trait rather than sort of the true score output. Okay. And for each item, what it tells me is where it measures the latent trait. Okay. So is it is it good at measuring people who are low on the latent trait, or is it good at measuring people who are high? And we've not covered this idea at all. What we've talked about is the loading. How well does the latent trait predict their answers on this scale or whatever, right? So how well does that item rep, you know, relate to the latent trait? And we've got these weights. And so last week, a couple weeks ago, we talked about weighted scores, right, by calculating with law of predict getting their factor means, or their latent means. But IRT takes this even a step further. For each item, where does it measure our continuous latent trait? Does it measure at the bottom, where it tells me the differences between people who score on the low end? Does it measure in the middle? right? Or does it measure at the top? So, the, And that's a continuous measure. And it tells me the discrimination. So if it's measuring right here, how well is it actually measuring right there? Okay, and this is more of a measure of, of, of weight. Right? So is it a really good discriminator? Right, so we know that everybody who marks, who gets this one wrong is over here, and everyone who gets this one right is over here. Or is it sort of a weak discriminator? It's not a very good item. And then for some types of scales, we can actually also measure guessing. Okay, but this is really limited to sort of true-false kinds of answers, like correct and correct. And so if we had more than two outcomes, sort of the yes, no, we can actually also make sure that our, our items are ordered. So if we have a one to five scale, do people actually fall on one to five? If you pick a one, are you likely to be on the bottom? Or if you're picking a one, are you in the middle? And that's all kinds of wrong. Okay, so we'll talk about ordering. And also the thresholds, where the items are most likely to be answered. Okay, the, the choices are most likely to be answered. 
that is just like a, a flip from what we've been kind of talking about the big picture up here. Like what are the what are the loadings? What are the variances? Now let's get down into the weeds. Where does each item work? How well does it work? And can we take out items that don't work? So some assumptions of IRT that we have not really covered. And the first big one is unidimensionality. You can do multiple IRT. This is where Merck really shines. Um, but generally, if you have, let's say, almost all of the measures that we've done have had these different scales, like the DAS, right? It's depression, anxiety, and stress scale. We want to run one IRT for each latent variable. So you can do multiples. It's probably easier to just separate them into different analyses, pros and cons here, uh, from which I'm not well versed enough to really speak. But uh, there is an assumption that there is one latent trait that we're measuring. So when if I know I have more than one, I split them up. Okay. And um, there are multi-trait options, though. The other one is uh, called local independence. It's a little bit trickier to measure. There are a bunch of ways to assess this, but I have never seen a way that doesn't come up significant. So I'm either doing it wrong or there. never have local independence. But essentially this idea is that once you control for the latent variable, okay, all of these items are related because of this latent variable, be it ability, depression, whatever the latent variable is, they're related because of it. After assessing for it, the items should be uncorrelated. And we've talked before about how items don't always do this. So there have been several times that we've added these error variance correlations because the two items on the scale are so similarly worded that, of course, the errors are related. So local independence is a difficult assumption in IRT, personally. Um, because probably because of the types of scales that I'm working with where we have these issues of, of measurement. Okay. Of like, well, these two items are very similarly worded. So yes, they're both related to the latent trait, but then we have a little bit of correlated error left over because of that design issue. Um, <clears throat> so why even think about IRT? Like, why, why is this so interesting? I just find it a very different view of weight trait models. Okay. So let's take a very simple example of why this is interesting. So let's say we have a three item questionnaire and you can either get it right or wrong. So we're going to keep this as simple as possible. Okay. And so you either get the question right or you get it wrong. That questionnaire has eight different response patterns. Okay. So zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, you get the idea. It's eight possible combinations. If I create a total score for you, right, that leaves us with zero, one, two, three. So it reduces down if I create a total score to four possible combinations, okay, if I can math correctly. So we've lost all of the information about the other, about all of the eight possible patterns and reduce that down to total score. So this is more classic test theory about total scores. Why wouldn't I keep all the information about the patterns themselves? So maybe it's people who get questions one and two right are scoring really high. People who get question three right, while it's one of the hardest questions, have totally don't understand the basics. Okay, unlikely, but maybe there's a pattern there. And that's where a lot of like computer adaptive tests are really interesting. So for example, the GRE is technically a computer adaptive test where the first question matters the most. And if you get that one right, you will slowly get, the more you get right, the harder and harder questions will get. Okay. If you get it wrong, they'll give you an easier question. If you get it right, they'll give you a harder question because they're trying to find the spot where you're at and level off. And it's really important that you get the first one right because then it's hard to come back up if you get the first one wrong for how it used to be scored. Uh, as far as I'm aware, that hasn't changed, but it is a computer adaptive test. The cool thing about computer adaptive tests is that you can really hone in on what their exact score should be by examining the pattern of their answers. 
and and giving them questions that are either right above or right below where someone should be scoring based on their patterns. And so we, we have this huge project that like has kind of died because life is hard, but uh, of, of thinking about this for complex things like meaning. So there are tons of meaning scales, right? Can we, instead of giving them 200 items, give them eight? Because we're gra we're doing a computer adaptive version of this of this um, of the scale, so they're only seeing questions that matter to them, that kind of thing. Okay. All right, so let's not lose all the information about patterns, and let's use the weight of each and the importance of each question to really answer some of these questions. Okay. So some terminology. All right. First one is an ICC or an item characteristic curve. So the item characteristic curve in a yes-no format creates us the log probability curve of theta. What the heck is theta? Theta is our latent variable. So the bottom of this graph will always either say theta or ability. It's mostly called ability because this is coming from test taking theory. So this is like, you know, this they don't want to use the word intelligence because that's not what this means, and this isn't smarts. This is just ability on whatever you're testing them on. Okay. So you know, if they're giving me a math test, it's my math ability. If you're giving me a word test, it's my word ability. That kind of thing. <clears throat> so it's a log curve, okay, and it um, has a place along ability that it measures the, um, is the most discriminable, so the 50/50 mark, basically. So for each question, we could calculate where it measures, how well it discriminates by the slope of the ability, and actually how easy it is to guess. So those each have names. So theta is our ability, or the underlying latent variable score, and we're trying to calculate that based on, on um, you know, their pattern of data. B here, sometimes called item location. Or um, difficulty is the other thing, another label that people give this, is the measure of where the probability of getting the item is 50 50. And so the blue item here is a higher ability item. It measures at the higher end, so it discriminates more at the higher end. So you would consider this question difficult, more difficult anyway, because you have to be at a higher ability to get it right. Whereas the red line here is at a lower ability than the blue one. And so this question would be usually be considered easier because um, more people are getting it right. And so right away, hopefully that makes it clear how this is really nice for test theory because let's say I'm trying to design a test that has items that measure all types of ability. They're not all easy. They're not all hard. This allows us to pick questions that um, measure a range of abilities. So if you're getting them right, and I can say, okay, your ability is higher, let me give you a question that's designed for higher ability people. So that would be B. Um, this is considered where the item performs best, and it can be think, thought of as difficulty. Uh, most people call this location, though, so it also applies to, to polytomous items, where we have like one through five, but right now, just think about it as how hard the item is. So if it's easy, it measures on the low end. If it's hard, it measures on the high end. The A parameter is listed as item discrimination. So looking here, what we see is that the blue colored item is less discriminable because the slope is flatter. If it were perfectly flat, it, it never discriminates. It's going to be a really bad item. Um, and the steeper the slope gets, the higher the A parameter, and the more discriminable it is. So both of these measure at the same ability level, but item red, or item one here, is much better because it has a steeper slope. If they were perfect, it would be a straight like step, um, but that would be improbable <laughs> to have um, when that happens, you should look and make sure you haven't done something wrong. Um, where items are like perfectly, perfect discriminators are kind of a weird, would be weird. Okay. Let's 
on the slide. So it tells you how well the item discriminates for the latent variable, or it's kind of a weight of how well this measures. Okay. Larger A values indicate better items. And uh, often I've seen a criteria where A should be close to or over one to be a good measuring item. Because this is not in continuous measurements anymore, so you can't use a 0.3 rule. Okay. But what it does is it plops a slope a slope on the line at the 50-50 point and calculates its steepness. Okay. We do want A to be positive because we want people who get it wrong to be on the lower end and people who get it right on the other end. So if you ever have a negative A value, check and make sure you haven't misscored it and then get rid of it because you don't want items that discriminate in the wrong direction. Okay. So people who get it wrong should be on the lower ability and people who get it right should be on the higher ability and you shouldn't flip-flop. We can also add a guessing parameter, and this is where we'll stop. There are other complex models, but we'll stop at the three parameters, A, B, and C. Okay. And the guessing parameter is sort of the, the how easy is this item to guess? Right? So it's the lower level likelihood of getting it correct. So A item 1 here has a guessing parameter of 0, okay. whereas item 2 here has a guessing parameter of slightly higher than 0, but not much. And this really comes from the background of having multiple choice questions that have four options. And so in theory, um, in a perfectly random world, the probability of getting it right is one out of four, because you just can guess. Now, well done questions are actually lower than that because um, you know, you've written item choices that are, are appropriate. But we'd want to know if an item has a has a guessing parameter of 50%. It's probably a little too easy. So, what can I run? Well, I can run what's called a one-parameter logistic model. You'll see these listed as 1PLs, okay, or RASH models. I generally don't recommend the RASH model. People love it, though. I don't know why. Because the only thing it estimates is location. It forces all of the um, discrimination parameters to be equal. And that is a very tenuous assumption to me, <laughs> that all of the slopes on A are exactly the same. There are some items that are good and some items that are bad. I have done scale development for, unfortunately, longer than I've realized now. The implication that all items discriminate in the same way seems dumb <laughs> to me. Um, so we're actually, not, I'm just not even going to show you how to do a 1PL. It's actually very easy to run um, in both of the packages we're going to look at. But in general, I don't think that this model makes a lot of sense. So we'll start with a 2PL, okay, or two-parameter logistic model, where it uses both A and B, so both location and discrimination, okay, or difficulty and discrimination is what's in the output. And then we can also add C to get the 3PL of the three parameter logistics, so it uses A, B, and C. Now it's an interesting question, is the two parameter or three parameter better? Do I need to estimate guessing? Which will tell you something interesting about your questions. All right, so that's dichotomous IRT. You'll see, you'll see me call it dirt in the output, or in the homework, because it's funny. <laughs> um, so a dichotomous IRT, right, where the where the options are binary. Maybe BERT would be better, but that's a new uh, language modeling system, so let's stick with BERT. And, and Polydemus IRT, which I have mostly labeled as MERT because that's the package you need to use. And so uh, kind of a second half to IRT is focusing on questions that don't have a right answer. I would say most of the work people do that I see in IRT, but this could be because I, I know a lot of education people, are on these yes, no, correct, incorrect questions. Okay. Um, because that's easier to think about. If the answers are right or wrong, ability makes a lot of sense. People who get things right, people who get things wrong. The real world, more complicated than that. So we can look at polydemous IRT which focuses on data that has these multiple response patterns but don't have a single right answer. 
So we're not collab we're we're gonna leave it as one to five and see what we can see. And the focus there ends up being on ordering. You want to make sure that people who answer one have a lower latent trait. People who answer five have a higher latent trait. So the items are ordered so that one is before two and two is before three and three is before four, that kind of thing. And um, generally this is on Likert type scales because the more uh, response points that you add, the more complex this gets. Um, so if the data is truly continuous, do EFA, CFA, any of this stuff you've learned this semester. If the data is this sort of weird interval mid middle ground with a low number of choices, you can go either way. And so when you do these types of models, there are more than a couple at this point. Whew, it's kind of overwhelming. So I'm just going to talk about the most popular ones, which include the graded response model, a generalized partial credit model, or just the partial credit model. In class, we're going to do the generalized partial credit model, but let me tell you what kind of a little bit about these differences. Okay. The graded response model is the simplest model, but it can be difficult to make converge. So literally to get to run. Okay. And what it does is it takes the number of categories that you have. So let's say we have our one to five scale and creates, um, so it takes the number of categories minus one is what this says, and creates little mini two PLs for each of those boundary points. Okay. So it says, okay, one versus the rest. So one versus answering a number one versus answering two, three, four, and five. Answer number two versus three, four, and five. Answer number three versus four and five, etc. Okay. And so it calculates the threshold for each item where you go from one to above one, two to above two. Okay. And that's conceptually very nice because it, it in, a, in a sense, forces ordering on it. And you can see if that model works or even runs. And so you get the probability of scoring at this level or higher. Now, the problem with the, the, with the graded response model is if your items are not ordered, it will blow up. And um, ordering is, a, is kind of a question. We want to see if it fits. So let's get a model that actually runs and make sure it fits. Now, you can compare a graded response model to a generalized partial credit model and see which one fits better. I've done that a couple times. Um, so generalized partial credit, partial credit models, there's just a slight difference in math. Um, account for the fact that categories are sometimes not selected. So I have my one to five, but people maybe only pick the ends. They never pick three. And the um, two PLs, right, our two parameter logistics occur at each boundary point. So one versus two, two versus three, three versus four. Okay. And so you can really easily see if they're not ordered. So this is a less, this assumption is a little bit um, less problematic than one versus everything else. Okay. If your items are ordered, you actually can get the same answer for both models. And that would be a good thing because it, it would be better if a, G, a generalized um, a graded response model fit the data, um, but it doesn't always work. So a generalized partial credit model can help elucidate why it's not working. Uh, one concern with partial credit models is making sure that all categories have a threshold. And this is where the graphs are, are really quite informative where each point has a point, so each uh, answer response, one, two, three, four, five, has a section of ability where it is the most likely answer. So if you see that you have like one is very popular, two is very popular, four is very popular, and five is very popular, and three is totally flat, that implies that your scale shouldn't be a five choice scale. It should only be a four choice scale because people are not using that middle choice. And so this can inform if your response options are appropriate. Are they ordered and then they each have a threshold 
if they don't, if, if you see a consistent pattern across your items where they don't have the five item threshold, you could consider reducing the options for participants. Uh, okay, so MERT. MERT is great for a multidimensional IRT. It also runs all these partial credit models. And so I have not played with the actual MERT part of MERT, where it does multidimensional. I have mostly suckered out <laughs> and done like two separate models to answer my questions. Um, I would also say that the guy who wrote MERT is really fantastic and loves to answer questions. So he's helped me with a lot of different things over, over the time. So I'm going to shout out to Phil. Um, and it's a great package. The LTM package is what we'll do for our uh, dichotomous hierarchy. Okay. All right. that. So let's play. So we're going to start with dirt. Don't really call it dirt. I just call it that to keep them straight. But where we have binary, it's a, it's, it's not even dichotomous. It's binary IRT. Okay. Um, so this data set is, I don't know where this data set's hidden, but it's the LSAT, which is the lawyer test. Okay. So people either get the question right or wrong. Okay. And so we're going to load here LTM for our, our binary IRT and MERT here for our um, polytomous IRT. Let's so just show you what's in the LSAT data. Well, it's only got five items. Another problem that you can have, and I mean, I'm not getting, we could teach an entire class on IRT alone, but another consideration is let's say you have 400 questions. Right? If you don't have enough data to run all 400 in one gigantic model, you can create what are sometimes called testlets where you run little subsets. Right? So I'm only going to run 10 items at a time. Now that does limit your understanding of a person's true ability because you don't have more measurements from them, but sometimes these models won't converge with hundreds of items. And so what I've done in the past with this issue is taken um, and kind of run, like if I had 20 items and they wouldn't all run together, okay, let's run uh, every combination of 10 of them that I can make work and kind of average all together. Uh, or found the bad item and took it out, that kind of thing. Uh, but always, as a warning, you always need way more um, rows than you have columns. Another issue here is power. Okay. Item response theory requires way more participants than your traditional structural model. I, I took a really awesome class in IRT one time and I asked this power question. And the answer was essentially... Uh, if it runs, you have enough people. If it doesn't run, you may not have enough people. There are better, um, newer thoughts on power, but it can be really hard to estimate. Okay, so why is that? Well, IRT is really interested in the patterns of responses, right? And so it's helpful to have many representations of each pattern. So if you have a lot of items, there are potentially many patterns, right? So with three items, there are eight patterns. With five, I haven't calculated it, but it's more than eight. Um, I think that's factorial, right? So three exclamation points. So it's three times two times one. No, that didn't work. There's a formula. K two times K for something. I don't remember. There's a formula to know how many different um, patterns there are um, when based on the number of items, right? And so you need a lot of data to represent all the possible patterns okay, to get a good answer. So power-wise, this can be, you know, if I'm doing a standardized test, I have thousands of responses from people taking it every year, so, you know, it works okay, um, but may not work on smaller data sets. So just a warning. But otherwise, these packages are blessedly easy, you know. <laughs> That's one thing I really like about them. So to run a 2PL, okay, what we do is we put in the data frame. So it, the data frame needs to be only the items that you're interested in. So don't include an ID number or any other categorical anything. It's like subset it down to just your items. Tilde Z1. Z1 just makes it the, the latent variable. I think you can actually call it whatever you want. It's just the examples have it as Z1, so I've always left it alone. Actually, I'm, that may be wrong. Let's look real quick. I may be misspeaking. Uh, 
let's see here. The formula. Uh, no. Only two latent variables are allowed with code names, Z1 and Z2. You can also do more complex formulas, but we're just starting here with, with the simplest stuff. And then it actually explains like the math behind this. So I lied to you. It should be Z1. Leave it as Z1 for um, our unidimensional measure. And then here you want to turn on IRT param equals true so that you get this in the traditional Z scored IRT format. To you guys, that doesn't mean anything, but with what I'm about to show you, um, for the assumptions, the, the numbers we're going to look at, you need the IRT param thing on. So to look at A being kind of close to or greater than 1, that bad boy needs to be on. All right. So the 2PL, the output here. So don't forget the difficulty in, in the label here, this is the first column, is B or where it measures theta. So this is where it's measuring the location of the ability. So looking at the difficulty parameters here, what we can see is that items 1 and 5 are very easy. It measures the difference. The people who get it wrong are below three standard deviations. So our latent trait variable is always in, is in z-score format in this um, IRT parameterization. So a zero score means they're scoring right at the mean of the latent trait, whatever that is. They're right in the middle of a normal distribution. A three is, ne is three z-scores below the mean. So this is, uh, you know, less than... Is that 1% of the population? Less than 1% of the population. Okay, so very low. These items are easy. Most people are getting them right. Okay. Items 2 and 4 are a little bit harder, but they're one standard deviation and almost two standard deviations below the mean. And item 3 is close to the mean. So we don't have any items so far that are difficult on the top end of the distribution. These are all easier items and when I say easy I don't necessarily mean they're like easy but people are people who are taking this test it is on the lower end of their ability uh, the discrimination parameter the second column is how good the question is figuring that person out so how how discriminable that item is at that location and so for this first item, right, this is an easy item, it's 0.8 discrimination. Okay, so we want these, you have to remember this is not EFA, so we want these to be close to or above 1. Okay. I would say most people use the cutoff as 1 for better or worse, and I don't even remember where, where I learned that or who's made up this rule. Um, but the higher is better. Okay, so all of these would be considered okay discriminators. I would say many of these actually we consider poor discriminators. Uh, at least they're not negative. So for these five LSAT questions, we have easy questions that are not very good discriminators. So, so far we're not doing so well. But maybe the issue is they're just easy to guess. So let's try a 3PL. Actually, let's look at plots and then let's try a 3PL. So the plots, to me, sell this story more than the tables. So I'm going to do plot LSAT model. Type equals ICC. This is a way to get all of them at once. If you want to investigate them one at a time, you just put a number right here. So you do plot LSAT model 1, comma, type ICC. And it'll show you just curve 1. So if you have a bunch of items, it's um, easier to maybe plot 1 through 5 at a time or something. We only have 5, so it's like giving everything at once. And they actually do continue off here and have are forced to all have the same zero uh, asymptote at zero because we do not have the guessing parameter in there. So the, the asymptote at the bottom is forced to be zero, but it has run off the curve, help the picture. Okay. Because the bottom here is ability. So that, you know, past, really past three standard deviations on ability, you're talking about very very far away from what you should be measuring for your latent trait, so they just kind of cut it off. So you can kind of see, none of these are those nice S logic curves. Three, sort of the best. So we'd want these to be more discriminable. 
one and five here particularly low, which we should see reflected. One and five. Three is kind of the best. It's sort of interesting. One does not maybe give me the super curve because it's so far at the bottom. <laughs> So they're not very good. This is not a pretty picture. You want them to be more logic curved and maybe to represent different areas of the um, ability curve. Right? We don't have any at the top. The other piece that we can get um, by adding items equals zero is what's called the TIFF or the test information function. This is a, a distribution of the ability scores given what your test is measuring. Okay. And so this varies. It kind of depends on what you want to do, right? So generally people say your TIFF should be centered over zero and follow the nice bell curve rules because your test should probably measure the most likely people, which in a Z score you know, in a normalized distribution is everybody between negative one and one. Okay, that's 64% of the curve. We look at our, our proportions of people who should fall in each quadrant of a distribution. Okay? And so it should be centered over zero and kind of nicely make a pretty bell curve. Okay? So what the test information function here tells me is that it is, mo it is giving me the most information about people who are two standard deviations below the mean. And that's maybe not what I want. Right? So do I only want to know stuff about people who are not very good lawyers? <laughs> right? Like, this is people who, whose scores are on the low end. Okay, what do I, I don't know nearly anything about the people on the high end. Okay. And this also is not a very, uh, I, information, I don't have a good uh, scale for this variable, um, but these numbers are low. We want more information. Uh, so the TIFF just kind of tells me like this would be the distribution of scores I would expect given these, um, me the measurement of these items. Okay, so this is not very good. Now, on the other hand, let's say I'm trying to find, I have a, a, a scale that I'm really trying to discriminate only the highest performers. And so I might want my test information function to only measure at the highest end. It is most gives me the most information about people on this high end because I'm offering them all these huge grants or whatever. Okay, so I, I, I need to discriminate the best and have the most information about two standard deviations above the mean. Okay. Or I'm trying to find the, the sweet spot for, for um, depression and anxiety to go back to our psych examples. And so we want people who only score really high on that scale or really low on that scale, whichever way it's coded. So there might be reasons that you want your test information function to be um, at one end or another. But in general, you want a scale to measure the whole range of people. And this bad boy is not. All right. So some other options that you can get out of LTM are factor scores. You can also get person scores, but I think factor scores make the most sense. Um, and what it does is it literally prints out all the different patterns. So with five items, it looks like there's 30 different patterns. If every one of these patterns happened. Um, so for example, uh, there could be more patterns. It's just here are all the patterns that happened. Okay. Uh, I feel like there should be more than 30, but who knows? And for each pattern, it tells you how many observations, how many people you had for that pattern. Okay. And it's sort of um, expectancy and Z score, but this, this is the good one here, this Z score. Okay. This is not a literal Z score, this is the latent trait. So if someone gets a pattern of getting them all wrong, it's measuring their latent trait as the, the smallest number which is good because if I get them all wrong, I should be on the lowest end of the scale. And so you can start to look at like if a person has a pattern where they get two of them right, if they get the last two right, they're at a negative one. Okay. But this person also got two right, okay. but they're at a little bit higher of a score because one of these is a little bit more, is a little bit harder, so to speak. 
And so this is where it starts to really be cool because it's discriminating between what would be a total score of two for several different folks and giving them different scores based on which ones, which two they got right. And so for me, that's really where IRT shines. Now, this person got two of them right and got a, uh, no, that makes sense, a negative one. This person got one right and is actually pretty close, but is a little bit lower score. And so these factor scores can be really interesting to think about the patterns and what you know, latent trait that suggests. So this would be getting, you could apply this to get the person's um, latent trait estimate. I think you can also do this with person scores where I'm going to get their latent mean back. And this is how, if you've taken one of these standardized tests and you've gotten your results back, I mean, they have the score, so like um, the GRE, when I took it 8 million years ago, you get 800 on the math and 800 on the on the verbal, right? They may have different scores now. Um, and then they give you a, a percentile rank. And this is essentially what they were coming up with. They calculated my latent trait score, and then based on that, converted that Z score into a, a percentile. Okay, now for the 3PL, we're going to do a um, TPM for a three-parameter model. You just put in L the data set, so it's a little different. The type here equals latent trait model, but be sure you turn on your item parameterization. So does adding the guessing parameter help? So let's see here. We've still got our difficulty. These don't change too much, usually. We've got our discrimination. Do notice they have changed a little bit by adding the guessing parameter. So they do change, but it shouldn't be like wild crazy. And now we've added guessing. So how easy is each item to guess? And those are actually pretty low. They're pretty close to zero. So these items are not very hard, but they're also not very easy to guess. And that may be because they're not very hard. <laughs> I mean, if we're getting them right, we're not guessing. So let's go look at our plots here. So, you know, if I extended the plot out here, we could see that they have different asymptotes, but they're all very close. Okay, this what the guessing parameter is here is the asymptote here on the left hand side. Uh, and this is pretty much cut off because these questions are so low on the uh, location, the difficulty parameter. My test information function pretty much shows me the same picture. It has shifted up, oops, sorry. It has shifted up a little bit. Okay, so the peak is now a little bit higher by adding that parameter. And I can use the ANOVA function to compare them, but here are my factor scores just to show you again. It, it's calculating, you know, somebody who's gotten these two right now actually has a, this, uh, Oh, this is three right. Sorry, where's one of my two rights? Here's one of my two rights. You say, okay, well, here's what their score should be. Okay. So these will move around because because um, we are adding a new parameter, but they don't tend to go too crazy when you add the new parameter. Now, we can't compare them with ANOVA. Um, this is not a very good set of models, so it doesn't really like that. But the cool thing about the ANOVA function is it also prints out the AIC, and we should go with the AIC that's lower, right? Um, so models with lower AICs, no matter what, like lower is lower, even if they're negative, um, is better. So in this scenario, the 2PL is better. So adding the information about the... Um, Guessing parameter doesn't help. And the reason why we're getting this error actually is if you look at the log likelihoods here, the subtraction, the difference between them is negative. And uh, chi-squared isn't negative, so it's really not happy about this. All right. So don't need the guessing parameter. And when most of your guessing parameter scores are close to zero, like they were 0 0.02, 0 0.05, then going from zero to do your own thing is not helping us. 
So that's um, binary IRT. Let's try polydomous IRT. And so I've uh, loaded up some data. This is the meaning in life questionnaire. I know I have so many meaning questionnaires. I probably have 30 or 40 questionnaires and thousands of data points because of the teams that I work with. But let's look at this. Okay. And the meaning of life questionnaire has one reverse coded item. So make sure you reverse code the items or you're going to get disordered thresholds. You're going to get everything is coded. You're going to see all these negative A scores and that's no good. That's a good clue that you've forgotten to reverse code the item or that the item's really bad. And I separated them into two different data sets because they are two separate factors. So we'll just look at one of those factors. So one of them is um, search for meaning, and one of them is, um, oh my god, Steger would kill me. The other one is not search for meaning, purpose. <laughs> like overall purpose and search for, search for meaning. Okay, so the function here is Mert. You put in the data set. You put in how many factors it has, so we're going to go with one. And then the item type here is um, GPCM for Generalized Partial Credit Model. And so you can change those based on whichever one you want. And I always feel bad because MERT is so cool. It does all this stuff and I use it for like the simplest things. Like just give me a graded partial credit model on six items. <laughs> okay, let's try again. All right. So see, he has it called it. Um, item factor analysis, so that matches the book. And let's see if we can see what types of options there are. So MERT actually also will do a rash model, 2PL, 3PL, and the 4PL, which I didn't want to get too much into. So MERT, I could actually totally ditch LTM, but LTM is a really great package. So uh, PS, with MERT, you can do all of these models that we've covered so far. Uh, we could do graded for the graded response model, uh, the graded rating scale model, uh, GPCM, and the GPCM IRT are our um, graded partial credit models. So there's even more, some I've never even heard of. Right? This is why MERT is so awesome. It does splines, it does monopoly, like tons of stuff. So that's where you would change it, is here. For which type of model you are. So if you want to compare a graded model to a generalized partial credit model, all you do is change that little parameter. Unfortunately, it does print out all this stuff. So it prints out the iterations as it's going because it's trying to, over here, find the change between models and reduce that to converge. <clears throat> now the cool thing about MERT is I can get the literal factor loadings, right? And sometimes um, that's really useful if you you know want to think about it kind of IRT style to make sure that these items actually relate to their latent trait. And so you would interpret this uh, summary option in the same way that we interpret um, factor analysis. And so we can tell at question nine, whoo, it's it's there, but it's really low. And this is a general pattern that you see with um, reverse coded items. They're always evil. Evil is a good word. Like there's something about reverse coded items on a scale. Like you need to make them all positive or all negative because so many times, like people use them to help make sure that people are paying attention or whatever, but they, they really can be problematic on scales. Like my vote is to never use them <laughs> because um, I've never seen them go well. There's, they always are answered differently. And you can see that here. Right? The loading for the reverse coded item is much lower than the rest. H2 here, remember, is kind of R squared. Uh, and it gives me my factor correlations where I only have one, so you know, perfectly correlated. So I kind of a little mini um, item factor analysis. Now this is where it's way more output. So Remember then generalized partial credit, it's going to do 1 versus 2, 2 versus 3, 3 versus 4, 4 versus 5, 5 versus 6, 6 versus 7. Okay. Um, so that creates six different comparisons because it's categories minus 1. And so B in all of these is 
the threshold, the point at which it stops, where people stop on the ability answering one and start answering two. And then the place where they start stop answering two and start answering three. So this is the threshold between adjacent items. Okay. So one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, etc. So to check for item ordering, you want to make sure that those thresholds are literally in mathematical order. Okay. So negative 1.9, 1.3, 1.1, 0.6, 0.2, 1.2. That's in order. You can also look at the pictures here, but you just want to make sure that these are literally ordered. So that's why it's called ordering. Now, you know, I can tell with some of these, question five here, they're shifted towards the lower end. So it never measures ability past one standard deviation above the mean. And so maybe we want items that stretch that out a little bit further. Or we want items that measure on both ends, right? Um, so we wouldn't want items that are all all negative all the time. Ah, here's a good one. Here's question nine. So that is not ordered. Okay. So that negative two should be at the bottom. <laughs> okay. And then the negative 1.6. So this one's really not ordered in any stretch. Because people who are answering this is two, three, three, four, four to five, five to six are scoring lower overall than people who are answering um, like three and one to two, two to three, three and four. That's not right, right. These people are scoring lower than these people. So that item is not ordered. So that's not a good item. Okay. Uh, that's another reason why it's not relating to a slate and trait very well. <laughs> so that's B. For A here, this is the same interpretation of A. It's the, it's kind of like, you know, across all of these, what is the, the slope? Um, for these different things, and we got some really good items. Right, these are all uh, over one. This item not so good, and so those two things will often kind of coincide. But I could have a really strong discriminator with an item that's backwards. Okay. This item's a mess. Item nine. All right. Now I can also calculate factor scores, okay. and so this is I just printed out the head of it. But for each participant, I can get their latent trait measure. So I'm going to make these plots. I'm going to put them all together. But if you have a bunch of items, this can get very small. And so there are ways to get like only one through five at a time. But here's how to get all of them at once. And what we want to do is kind of zoom in and just look. So I can see the ordering by looking at the the B value, so here's the problematic question. But the other thing that you want is where each one has a threshold. Okay, so the, the one over here is always going to be, usually going to be point 0.1, because um, not uh, choice number one, and then this is choice number last. But they can cross over each other. So look at item nine here, where um, the choice six here, so this is just one color, line for each color. So seven is completely overlapping six. <laughs> like they should not, the high peak here should be on the other side of this one. So this is a good item. Each item is in order and each item has a point at which is the most probable. And so it's tiny here, but one, two, three does have a point where it is the most probable. So the peak should always be above everybody else at some point. Now, three appears to be a rather unlikely choice for many. Like, there's only a small range of ability that answers three. But it does seem to be at least used. And so sometimes what you see is items, especially in the middle of a scale, that just never get used. And so that's when you know you need to reduce the number of choices on the scale. And so question nine here is just a hot old mess. Um, Choice two is the lowest, right? It never has a it never has a highest point. Choice five never has a highest point. Uh, six sort of does very briefly, but this this item in general all signs point to a miss. And then we can also get our um, 
the ICC, the I'm sorry, I, I see information information ICC. It's not an I it's not an information characteristic curve, but it's kind of an information plot curve for each one. Um, so this is essentially like a TIF. So it's information, I'm sorry, item information curve, if I can talk, <laughs> item information curve. So it's not an item characteristic curve, that's for a binary data, item information curve, right? Uh, where it's kind of like a TIF, but for each item. So item number four here is measuring people the best a little below average. But it does, it is kind of, it's like, a, so it's a, what, positively skewed? So it is giving us a good amount of information um, in some of these other spots too, but it's a little below average where it peaks. So I can look at each one one at a time, um, but then we can also get the, the TIF, the test information function or curve. And so you can see over here, information is much taller, right? So I don't have a good conceptual number to give you here on like, this level of TIFF is good, but more is always better. Less than one would be pretty, it's pretty bad. And so in general, the MLQ for this particular half of the MLQ is measuring below average. So it, it is most informative for people who are below average levels of meaning. But, you know, it's doing better than um, our LSAT <laughs> for sure. And um, one thing to note is that this, these are not always as pretty. So like on the on one of the assignments, there's one that like has a bunch of spikes. And so you'll see that where it like goes up and down where there are questions that measure really good at the bottom and really good at the top and you got nothing in the middle. So you can get information that are something that's called spike and slab in Bayesian terms where you have like a big spike at the bottom, nothing, and then a big spike at the top. Okay, so bimodal distribution. Um, and that'll happen when you have a bunch of items at the bottom and a bunch of items at the top. Okay, so they're not always like pretty density functions like this one. But that's informative. I need questions that measure the middle now to get the full range of data. Uh, and then our expected score curve, right? So this is like the like expected kind of total score, right, versus theta. And so this can help you put it back in the scale of the data, right? Um, so, you know, at, at an average level of theta, they should be scoring this on our scale. And so you want this uh, to be a nice like, cumulative function. So you don't want like a whole bunch of like steps. <clears throat> All right, so in summary, that is your very brief introduction to IRT. It is way more complicated than I am making it, but um, with those armed with this kind of basic information, you can really, really zoom in on items. So I really like IRT when I'm interested in the performance of each item. I really like EFA when I'm developing the scales and, and just, you know, trying to get good items that measure their uh, latent trait well, uh, and then start looking at them for IRT. Are the responses ordered? So the, these, to me, like people sometimes run only in EFA or only in IRT. And I really think if you look at both together, you get so much information about the items and if they're useful. So this can be very handy for scale development, um, as well as sort of test theory. So we compared IRT to sort of classical reliability test theory. We just I showed you how to run binary or dichotomous or traditional IRT with a 2PL and a 3PL because I think the RASH model is silly, but you can also run the RASH model. Um, and then how to run it with uh, polytomous IRT using a graded partial credit model. But with MERT, it is very easy to just flip that and go, you know what, okay, fine, run the uh, 2PL or run the da, 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 graded response model. Uh, and then how to compare models and think about what their output is telling you. Okay. There's so much more you can do with IRT, but I wanted to end there because it is um, a complement to many of the latent trait models that we've done this semester. And, um, you know, armed with this CFA kind of ideas that we've learned, we can then really get into what are these items telling you.
Plus, bonus, if you do um, use Levon and order your items, what you're going to get out of that is thresholds. So hopefully now the threshold thing will make more sense. You'll have the threshold between one and two and two and three and that kind of um, that kind of stuff in the output rather than one like continuous correlation loading for each item, you'll get these thresholds. So um, a little bit on how to deal with categorical predictors in latent trait models. And congrats, that means we have made it to the end of a very long and weird semester. So huzzah. That wraps us up. Questions?